Good morning, everyone. I am Faustine Zoveda, Forestry Officer with FAO's Forest and Landscape Restoration Mechanism. And together with my colleague, uh, Valentina Garavaglia, we have the pleasure to welcome you to this GLF event dedicated to the launch of Una Silva issue number 252, entitled Restoring the Earth, the Next Decade. Please make sure to use the chat box at any time during the event to share your questions and thoughts. We would like to start by giving the floor to Musunda Mumba, Terrestrial Ecosystems Team Leader and Lead for the UN Decade on Ecosystem Restoration for Terrestrial Ecosystems at UNEP, as well as the Chair of the Global Partnership on Forest and Landscape Restoration for a few words of introduction. Thank you very much, Fustina. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this amazing Una Silva launch pad. What an honor. I'm really privileged and honored as the chair of the GPFLR and together with my vice chair, uh, Dr. Jim Hallett, we co-authored the editorial of this amazing 252nd version. Now, here we are in the middle of a pandemic, COVID-19. If there's ever been a moment in human history where we've been now thrown and thrust to the very front and shown that we are as humans very vulnerable, it's now. And also the realization that we only have one health, the health of the planet and our health. And this intersectionality is so critical. And in this particular version of Una Silva, we're so excited to talk about forest land and landscape restoration. Why does this matter? The GPFLR as a platform and as a network has many, many organizations that are working on this very topical issue. Because what FLR does is to really bring together the intersectional element of not just restoring the degraded landscapes, but also improving the human well being of, of ourselves, our very well being, and that of the planet. But I want to say that there's so much that has been happening, the Bond Challenge, the Aichi targets of the Convention on Biological Diversity, so much has been you know, really going on and a lot of work happening around these ecosystems. Lastly, but not the least, I just want to say that at this juncture in our history, we have this decade on, you, on the United Nations on, for ecosystem restoration. And this particular decade is so important for all of us really a moment, a movement to begin to do so much work. We have such amazing speakers. And so I want to hand over to my colleague um, back again, Faustine. Thank you so much for joining us and enjoy the rest of the session. Thank you, Musunda, for setting the scene. Uh, as you highlighted, much progress has been made to, during the last 10 years, restore our degraded forests and landscapes. But a lot remains to be done to meet the ambitious national and international targets by 2030. So the publication we are launching today comes at a time where lessons learned and innovations need to be shared to enable the spread of this global restoration movement. And Una Silva is an international journal that really aims at bringing significant global developments in forestry to a broad range of readers. It is also FAO's longest running periodical. And so it was the natural space for FAO to gather and disseminate experiences related to restoration. This publication is the result of a collaborative effort with 100 authors from 30 organizations throughout the world, some of which are present today. Uh, it describes new restoration initiatives and programs that differ from the business as usual as they channel more funds, they better empower local stakeholders, and they provide enhanced technical assistance through coalitions of partners. The publication also presents innovative technical approaches to increase the adoption of restoration. Those approaches have a huge potential to be mainstreamed for different reasons. Their low cost, their relevance to many ecosystems and contexts, their easiness of implementation. And finally, this Una Silva issue focuses on factors that underpin successful implementation, such as policies, institutional coordination, and capacities. FAO just celebrated its 75th anniversary, and restoration has long been an important activity for the organization. 
Uh, FAO established the forest and landscape restoration mechanism in 2014, specifically to support countries meeting their ambitious pledges under the bond challenge and related regional processes such as AFR 100, among others. And to date, 20 countries throughout the globe have been supported by the forest and landscape restoration mechanism and activities on the ground are implemented in partnership with local, national and international organizations. Uh, this publication builds on the wealth of knowledge and expertise gathered from these practical experiences and includes case studies from Kenya, the Niger, Madagascar, China and many other countries. They highlight once again that restoration is complex and that the success of restoration interventions comes from a unique combination of critical social, economic, technical and institutional aspects. All those aspects are carefully scrutinized in this Yuna Silva issue, and Valentina and I would like to discuss them in depth with a panel of experts, including Adriana Vidal, who is Senior Forest Policy Officer at the International Union for the Conservation of Nature, Tom Lalampa, who is Chief Executive Officer at Northern Rangelands Trust in Kenya, Christophe Bezassier, who is Senior Forestry Officer at the Forest and Landscape Restoration Mechanism of FAO. Julian Noel Rakoto Ariso, who is Director General of Environmental Governance at the Ministry of Environment and Sustainable Development of Madagascar. And Katie Raytar, who is Senior Research Associate at the World Resources Institute. So uh, let us start with the questions to our panelists. Adriana, here is the question for you. Achieving the target of 350 million hectares of the bond challenge by 2030 will play a major role to conserve our world's biodiversity, mitigate climate change and safeguard ecosystems. You co-authored an article focused on the international restoration pledges. Please tell us what are the major achievements of the Bond Challenge and associated regional initiatives since they were launched and what are the main challenges ahead? Thank you, Valentina. I would like to highlight three major achievements of the Bond Challenge. First, it has triggered an accelerating pace of FLR implementation in developing and developed countries. The Bond Challenge was launched in 2011 and was quickly picked up by countries. A critical support to materialize these pledges was the Restoration Opportunities Assessment Methodology, or ROME. ROME has been applied or is underway in 50 national or subnational jurisdictions across more than 1 billion hectares of land, offering a participatory approach to establish roadmaps of where and how to restore and to map the expected economic and non-economic benefits of FLR. Second, the Bond Challenge has brought together a diverse group of partners that have been instrumental in the implementation of letters. By September this year, more than 210 million hectares had been pledged by 74 countries, subnational governments and private organizations. International investment is expanding for the implementation of Bond Challenge pledges and, and FLR, including by the GEF and the GCF. As evidence of results, the Barometer of Restoration Progress, which is a comprehensive approach for building an accurate and useful picture of progress, has shown rates of implementation between 56% up to 89% in, eight, in 18 countries that were assessed. An additional 20 countries will apply the barometer in 2020 and 2021. A third major achievement is the emergence of regional initiatives in Africa, Latin America, Asia, and Europe. Members of the Bond Challenge in the same regions with similar or shared ecosystems and challenges have benefited significantly from belonging to a multi-stakeholder community of action. The success of the Bond Challenge can be seen in the growing extent of international deliberations on restoration. For instance, the Decade on Ecosystem Restoration adopted by the UN in 2019 set its grounds in the Bond Challenge and expands its vision covering all ecosystems, such as wetlands and coral reefs. 
the implementation of the bond challenge pledges can provide a model of success for the decade. As the bond challenge is heading to its next milestone, it is going to be critical to promote participation of all actors across levels and sectors to effectively address the drivers of ecosystem degradation and steepen the curve of implementation. Expanded monitoring and tracking will generate more visibility of the progress being made. There are still many opportunities for designing restoration programs in a synergistic manner, as well as opportunities to dedicate national and international finance to restoring our future. Thank you, Adriana. So let us now move from the international scene and from the policy setting to where the change will actually take place and be implemented on the ground. So I now have a question for Tom. Tom, could you please tell us more on how communities can become the champions of the forest and landscape restoration movement? And what can we learn from your experience in Kenya? Um, well, thank you so much, uh, Faustine, and uh, welcome to Kenya in, Ast in East Africa. Uh, just to say the fact that uh, we got a real partnership uh, with the FAO uh, in Kenya, Northern Kenya, working with the rural communities. The Northern Rangeland Trust is a community umbrella organization supporting community-based conservancies. Uh, these are communal lands uh, with indigenous people. And the model of a community conservancy uh, is enabling us to create the enabling conditions for community-based land restoration. Um, there's a real community participation, uh, engagement, uh, decision-making, because these community conservancies are own, uh, led and run by the uh, indigenous communities. Through the model, we are able to uh, work with the indigenous communities to develop uh, a, a conservancy management plans that takes care of their forests, uh, take care of their rangelands and the health of their rangelands. Um, through the same model, we are really uh, uh, supporting uh, BESPOC uh, leadership and management uh, uh, training for our local communities. And the model of the community conservancy is such that uh, it helps us to integrate traditional knowledge, uh, research and uh, best practices. Um, at the present, we are working with the uh, local communities and the local governments uh, to, de to develop uh, uh, rangeland policies that will support our rangelands. The community conservancy model is such that it's helping, uh, it's helping in stabilizing grasslands, which is, which is so critical for our livestock and our wildlife. We are partnering very closely with FAO uh, to work with the local communities in northern Kenya to reverse uh, uh, rangeland degradation and trying to manage uh, with the local communities the invasive plant species that, uh, that colonize uh, degraded rangelands. And so through the model, the community is really working to develop uh, grazing management plans uh, that uh, at, a, at a conservancy level, at a regional level, and at the county level. These are these real uh, participatory approach by uh, our local communities. And we're trying to integrate um, rangeland restoration uh, with the enterprises, with the peace building, uh, so that it's, it's a bit more holistic. The conservancy model uh, as well enables us to enhance participatory planning and implementation of forests. Um, a number of the indigenous communities are now forming a, 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 a CFAs, these are community forest associations uh, in partnership with the government of Kenya, Kenya Forest Service, allowing the indigenous communities to manage these government forests uh, and utilize. And in the process, um, the, the process is such that it's very participatory. It's owned by the uh, indigenous communities. We got a case in point of one of our communities uh, called Ngarendare uh, Forest Trust, which is expanding the forest canopy, Kafa. Uh, in the area and also engaging in good tourism uh, operations and uh, meaningful community impact. It's massive. It's about really um, a, a participation uh, of the local communities um, and the success lies there um, when we engage them in a very structured way and uh, let them own this process. And we're seeing a massive change both in the health of our lands, our grasslands and our forests and so it's a amazing initiative and it's really good. Um, it's been such a, an opportunity to partner 
uh, with the FAO on the ground, working with the local communities. Back to you, Faustin. Thanks a lot, Tom, for, for sharing those uh, inspirational examples. So before Valentina takes over, I have a last question for Christophe. Um, various articles in the publication highlight the importance of adapted finance mechanisms and channels for the restoration of degraded landscapes. So Christophe, could you tell us more about those approaches and why they are promising in terms of upscaling forest and landscape restoration? Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Faustine. Uh, the financial resources needed to achieve global restoration targets on forest landscape restoration are huge. Uh, achieving the bond challenge, 250 million hectares restored by 2030, represents investment equivalent at 49 billion US dollars a year. So to cover those uh, annual needs in terms of restoration investment, several sources of funding are available of course, climate finance, national budgets, international cooperation, environmental funds, such as the, the, the GEF, private sector, etc. Um, to achieve this global target, it is clearly necessary to mobilize all these different types of investors, both public and private, considering their specific uh, expectation in terms of return on investments and also their acceptation of risks. The use of uh, various financial uh, um, mechanisms for forest landscape restoration initiatives, grants, loans, microfinance, fiscal incentives, risk mitigation mechanisms, etc., needs to be considered uh, in order to bring financial resources to local stakeholders uh, within territories to be restored, landscapes, decentralized jurisdictions, such as communes and districts. Clearly, project promoters' capacities need uh, to be reinforced in order to attract investors uh, on forest landscape restoration. Uh, project promoters have to make their project easy for investors to discover, to understand, to evaluate. They have to prepare concept notes and business cases highlighting the key economic and finance parameters of their project in order to allow investors to identify clearly the costs and the benefits, both economic and environmental, of their future investment on forest uh, landscape restoration. Several articles in this special issue of Fina Silva, uh, mobilizing restoration finance at the local level, led by Jonathan Gessen from UNEP, green investment in the Sahel, the role of local governments and communities, led by you, Faustin, uh, and upscaling restoration, how to unlock finance, led by Vincent Gitz, are providing examples of relevant financial mechanism established at national or decentralized levels and proposed, uh, proposed approaches, uh, tools, study cases uh, of bankable project, uh, tools and study cases to support project promoters in the preparation of bankable projects, able to attract multiple investors and consequently to upscale globally forest and landscape restoration. Over to you, uh, Faustino or Valentina. Thank you, Christophe, and thank you, Faustine, for the intervention so far. My turn now to pose questions to our guests. My questions goes to Julien Noel. Uh, Julien Noel, you were leading an article of Una Silva that was focusing on a key point to implement uh, restoration, which is coordination. So the question for you is, how has coordination across sectors and stakeholders materialized in the context of restoration projects? And what are the key success factors that emerge from those experiences? Thank you very much, Valentina. Coordination across sectors and stakeholders in the context of restoration projects represent a comprehensive governance exercise to establish of a well-organized institutional arrangement that includes categories of stakeholders directly or indirectly involved in the restoration process and guarantee cross-sectoral dialogue to foster the adoption of landscape approach. In Madagascar, for example, the government proposed setting up a multi-sect stakeholders mechanism to break down the land use sector silos and enhancing cross-sectoral coordinations. At the national level, this coordination mechanism 
enable stakeholders to interface with policymakers and law enforcement officials. Both are crucial for building a favorable environment for restoration. At the decentralized level, technical working groups on restoration were created to ensure the participation of stakeholders at the landscape level and the coordination of activities at the sites to be restored. For Madagascar, the main success factors are and will be the existence of coordination tools, such as the National Forests and Landscape Restoration Strategy, which constitutes a framework for the various stakeholders involved in the restoration process. The flexibility of the coordination mechanism that adapts to the progress made in restoring the degraded landscape and evolves over time to meet the changing needs as progress has been made towards Madagascar forest and restoration commitments. Working on having continuous support in terms of projects, funds, expertise, capacity building for the proper functioning and efficiency of a coordination mechanism to maintain and enhance the dynamism along the process. This process is long and requires the active collaborations of many stakeholders at different level, but it seems indispensable for ensuring coordination on the ground and thereby the effectiveness and sustainability of FLR interventions. Back to Valentina. Thank you so much, uh, Julien Noel, and thank you for having provided an example of what is happening about coordination in your country. Uh, the last but not least question goes to uh, Katie. Uh, Katie, uh, you are an expert at WRI. And uh, as said in uh, several occasions in the UNASIBA publication, restoration needs to be measured and monitored. So the inclusion of forest and landscape restoration in uh, international commitments and government and corporate agendas is uh, relatively new. Uh, so the need to monitor such commitment is still a developing field of study. The question for you is, what are the overarching challenges that remain in the field of monitoring? Can you explain that more? Yes, thank you, Valentina. Um, as you mentioned, monitoring restoration is still a developing field of study. And we've identified a few key challenges through our work on monitoring over the past few years. Um, firstly, just the nature of restoration is that it has a long time horizon. It can take years or decades to be able to see st substantial change on the ground. Um, and so you need a monitoring protocol that accounts for such a long time scale. Um, secondly, restoration practices and activities themselves can vary widely, ranging from planting and regenerating areas of dense forest, to sparse tree cover on farms and pastures, to terracing of steep hillsides, and all of these activities have a different footprint on the landscape and so need different approaches to measure change. Um, and, and lastly, there's, there are currently no globally consistent methods or, or protocols for measuring progress on restoration. And so we need to come up with more cohesive standards um, that can be applied and managed more broadly. Um, and one way of tackling these challenges, um, which we're exploring at WRI and with partners like FAO, Climate Focus, IUCN and others, is to focus on, on monitoring at different scales and utilizing tools that are best suited for that scale. Um, the, the three scales that we've identified to focus on are, are project, landscape, and global. And each one of these has different monitoring questions associated with it. Um, for example, at project scale, which could be an area of just a few hectares, you'd want to use the highest resolution imagery possible to, to capture individual trees and combine that with field level monitoring um, to capture new growth that can't necessarily be detected through remote sensing. Um, but this type of monitoring would be prohibitively expensive to do at a global scale. And so at global level, where you're interested in assessing restoration progress within a broader context, such as comparing country commitments to the bond challenge, you could use coarser data to develop globally consistent data sets, such as through uh, 30 meter Landsat imagery, 
and a sampling approach such as through Collect Earth, which would enable you to cover a much wider area more efficiently. Um, and given that we have limited time today, uh, much more detail on how we've explored monitoring at different scales is featured in the Unisilva article titled Measuring Progress in Forest and Landscape Restoration. Thank you. Thank you so much, Katie. So, and thank you so much to all the guests to this uh, uh, launch pad. Uh, I have the pleasure to uh, close this event with few words. I want to highlight that, uh, as uh, uh, Faustine mentioned at the beginning of our, this event, uh, Una Silva is really an historical publication of FAO. Uh, this edition, the 252, it's really uh, key and comes in a, a critical time. As Muzonda said, we are in an ecological crisis related to the pandemic, and we are at the beginning of the UN decade for ecosystem restoration. So what the publication is showing is what has been done in the last decade and what still needs to be done in the next one. Uh, this publication will provide you with uh, many, many technical details that will set up the scene at international level, showing you what are the progresses at international level to achieve the international pledges that we have and that the countries are uh, implementing. And at the same time, as Katie uh, highlighted, uh, there will be many technical uh, uh, articles that will uh, provide you information with many new advances in technologies related to uh, restoration. Uh, as Katie said, monitoring is a key point uh, for measuring the results of restoration, but there are many technical aspects that are addressed by the publication. Uh, as uh, uh, Julien Noël and Tom highlighted, there are many case studies uh, we have seen today, Kenya and Madagascar, but as Faustine also mentioned, we have many other countries, uh, Niger, Burkina Faso, China, that are presented in the publication showing what has been done so far, what needs to be done, what has not been working and what ne we need to do to have it working. Uh, restoration, it's a complex thematic, it's a complex topic, it's a long process, and what is really needed is collaboration between different parties and stakeholders. This uh, publication is uh, uh, really an example of collaboration. As said, we have 30 institutions, including countries, of course, and 100 experts in different fields of restoration that are providing their point of view and their expertise in this publication and they will show their results and the lesson learned that could be replicated and also used to inspire further uh, implementation in the field. So collaboration is key and this is an example. Uh, and it's something that we really need to implement in the next decade, ensuring the collaboration of different stakeholders and ensuring that restoration still is an inclusive process that needs to be implemented in the field. Um, as uh, mentioned at the beginning of the event, there is a chat room uh, that you can use to post questions and ask for more details. The publication will be online since today in English, but it will be published soon also in other languages such as Spanish and French. So you will be informed about the next uh, launches in different languages. But so far, we hope that you will be, uh, you will enjoy the content of this huge publication that has been a huge effort of many partners. I would like to thank you all for being guests uh, in this event. The speakers that have intervened to uh, this uh, event and provided their expertise showing what they have been doing uh, for the publication and for the project they are implementing. And we hope to receive your feedback on the publication. Thank you so much and have a nice day.